another river landing conversation. I'm Jim Kalaki, here with Helen Shields again to um, have a lovely visit with two of our good friends and residents, um, Francis and Bonnie Smith. Welcome to both of you. Thank Thanks. you. Helen, lead us off. We know that you go by Francis. Would you tell us something about the background of your name and then we'll let Bonnie talk. Sure. Yes, Francis uh, is the name I go by and one of the interesting factoids is if you're ever writing the name Francis and it's a male, it's H-I-S, his, is a way to remember it with an I, or if you're writing the name Francis, that's a female, hers, H-E-R-S, is with an E. So I'll I've been educating people all over the world <laughs> about the difference between the male and female. Um, in Spanish, I'm called Francisco, or sometimes Pancho, if I know the person very well. And one of the interesting factoids about River Landing is that after we moved here, I was trying to learn all the names of the streets. And there's one called Macamy, and um, it's named after Francis Macamy who was the father of American Presbyterianism. Wow, interesting. Um, I'm not sure that, about the origin of my name, uh, but my name is Bonnie Francis. So when people accidentally call me Francis, which they do quite frequently, all, have for years, um, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> and you, of course, are Francis with the D. With an E, yes. that's right. Yes, <laughs> great. Um, Francis with an I. Yes. Um, where, where did you grow up and then from, move from there? Okay, uh, I was born in the eastern part of North Carolina, a, a small town called Wilson, and uh, my father accepted a job in Durham when I was only two, so I really don't remember much about it where I was born, but uh, hometown would be Durham, North Carolina, and um, that's where all my childhood memories are, because I grew up in the city until age 15, and um, then at 15, we moved to the country to a little town called Bahama, B-A-H-A-M-A, -A -A. here's another factoid, uh, it comes from the three families that founded this little village the balls, the halls, and the mangums, the B-A-H-A-M-A. -A. So it's not pronounced Bahama, it's pronounced Bahama, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I've had the wonderful privilege of kind of being a hybrid city and country boy uh, mm -hmm. my growing up years. Uh, I was born and grew up in Roxburgh, North Carolina, Person County, which is about 25 miles north of Durham. And um, it's a small town, and uh, one of the characteristics of it is how it's friendly people. And uh, I was reminded of that several years ago after living in the Winston-Salem area in Clemens and all. Um, I thought I was friendly until I went back to my hometown. <laughs> and in Roxborough, people speak to you even if they don't know you. And so that's the standard I thought. I felt very guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, of course, North Carolinians generally would like to think that uh, that's the case all over the place. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Right. That's right. Uh, many of our residents and friends here have moved a lot before they came to River Landing. Uh, you have moved a lot, so. Why don't you just tell us somewhat about where you were before you came and how you ended up at River Landing. Okay, I'll start. Bonnie will probably have to help me on sure. this one. But um, we lived in Durham and then Roxburgh, her hometown. And then we moved to Siler City, North Carolina, uh, home of Aunt B, uh, if you remember her from uh, the show, uh, Andy Griffith show. And then um, we moved to uh, San Jose, Costa Rica for one year because we were in Spanish language school um, five days a week there for a whole year. And then from there, we went to our country of service and we lived in Temuco, Chile, which is the southern part of Chile, beautiful 
uh, lakes and snow-capped volcanoes and very friendly people. And then we returned in um, 1991 to the States. Uh, we'd been gone for seven years, that, that whole experience, and lived in Winston-Salem. And then uh, Clemens, we lived there for about 26 years and came to River Landing uh, two years ago in February. So that's we, kind of a chronological order. I'm sure when we were missionaries uh, mm -hmm. there. When we got married, Francis was working for Wachovia Bank. Then he worked for uh, the Boy Scouts of America as a district scout executive, and then we became and then he was called to the ministry. And um, after several years of serving stateside, is when we went to Touch River in Chile. I'm fascinated with, um, and we've talked about this before elsewhere, but um, having grown up in Ireland which has got a long tradition of, um, we used to call them the foreign missions. Um, yeah, that's, that's right. The same right. sort of thing. But what was it like um, arriving in southern Chile um, from um, Durham and Roxbury and, right. um, and North Carolina, and all of a sudden you're there, the Monday morning has arrived on your first day of work, what was, what do you remember about that? Well, we never <laughs> imagined living outside the United States to start with. So mm -hmm. growing up, we just assumed we would always live in North Carolina. And so it was a bit of a surprise uh, on October 10th, 1976, when God called me to the ministry. I, those were not my plans. I was, had been the banker and the scout executive, was very happy, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so he <laughs> He decided to interrupt with his plans in that process. Um, living in Central America and then in South America, uh, of course, they're two different uh, climates and all that. But when we landed in Santiago, Chile, the capital, the first thing that struck me mm -hmm. was how European uh, this large city of 10 million people mm -hmm. looked, the architecture, everything about it. So the southern cone of South America, Chile, Argentina, is very European in culture, language, and, and other things as well. And so we went from the Central America, kind of tropical climate. Uh, our teachers were from different countries, uh, mainly in Central America, to Chile. And in Central America, they would speak uh, Espanol. In Chile, you speak Castellano you're from the region of Castilla, Spain. Mm -hmm. and so there was a slight difference in that, and um, but we had a lot of missionary friends and national friends who, who helped us make that transition and become acclimated, and that's why. We, yeah, yeah, we didn't have the internet then. This was, uh, we went to Costa Rica in 85 and left in 86 and arrived in Chile in 86, and uh, our knowledge of Chile was based on having talked with a few missionaries who were home on furlough and looking it up in the encyclopedia, which didn't give mm -hmm. us much to go on. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't realize how, how European it was going to be. And so when we got off the plane, I thought, we got on the wrong plane. <laughs> 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 this is Europe. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Can you give us some insight into not your work, like your hobbies or interests or things like that, that uh, have brought you joy in the past and things you want to do in the future, maybe? I've always loved to be outdoors. I think that goes back to growing up on the farm. Uh, we had a lot of woods and a lake, a um, pretty big size lake nearby, going fishing, uh, walking with my dog in the woods, cutting our Christmas tree from our own land each year. So I love being outdoors. Um, reading has always been a hobby of mine. And of course, um, all genres of, of music as well. Um, the fishing has kind of gone throughout my, my life and I've enjoyed telling those tall tales. 
the big ones that got away at the pond over here. I won't tell you which pond because that's inside of the <coughs> um, Riding my bike, I love to, to ride my bike and um, just listen to really good music, um, whether it be neo-traditional country or praise and worship or any kind of, uh, of music. Beach music. Beach me. Oh, yeah, the old Eagles and, and the yeah. Beach Boys and all that. And we've got tickets to see Alan Jackson in concert October 8th in Nashville, Tennessee. So, um, <laughs> there's some other. We love to go to concerts. So. We do. We do. Um, I have a lot of interests, but uh, it's kind of a, I like a lot of things, but. I'm not a, not much of a specialist. Mm -hmm. Especia uh, uh, I love to learn. That mm -hmm. is my driving force. I like to learn something new, even if it's useless information to me. <laughs> that doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be useful or practical. I just like to learn it. Cool. Uh, but yeah. What? Well, well, if going back to your overseas life for a while, um, were there hobbies or sports or activities that you you did there that you mightn't have done? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of mountain climbing or uh, outdoor, you mentioned the outdoors interest, but that you were able to do there that were somewhat unique. I remember a time we went um, to play in the snow on the side of an active volcano so we went about halfway up the volcano. There was a group of us uh, missionaries, and I think they had the inflatable it, tires. Or I think it felt like halfway up. It seemed yeah. close by, and then we looked at how tall it was. We said, I don't think we were as far up as we felt. <laughs> yeah, but it was a lot of fun. There's a lot of Europeans come to Chile during uh, their summer, which is our winter in mm -hmm. Chile. And uh, But anyway, that was fun, just sliding down the side of a volcano. <clears throat> You don't get to do that every day. We stayed there long enough to, for it to really <clears> feel <throat> like home. And when we, we've been back several times to visit. And mm. one of the times we were visiting, we were downtown, and it was lunchtime. And I called myself saying, okay, now it's time to go home. Mm. And then I realized we didn't live there anymore. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> And a lot of my, my time was spent up in the Andes Mountains. So even though we lived in this city of 300,000 people, um, I was a church planter, so that meant I was starting new churches alongside the nationals. And so there was these beautiful drives up in the Andes Mountains and rivers and lakes and the volcanoes and just natural beauty and the hot springs. And so one of mm. our activity hobbies was to find another uh, thermal hot spring and go soak in it for a while. Oh, and nice. then if you were really brave, you'd jump out and run down to the ice cold river, up to your knees maybe, and then you'd run back and jump into the hot springs again. But uh, my memories really of, of people, how great they were, how patient they were, encouraging, and how open they were. Yeah. I'm, I'm always curious, too, about when Americans go live overseas, what was it like being an American moving into a new culture? Because in some cases, as you well know, Americans overseas initially are not the most popular people right. in the world simply by being labeled as Americans, but it doesn't sound like that was your experience. Well, and I, and I just want to give credit to uh, our mission board because they did eight weeks of orientation and training before we left United States, mm -hmm. and so we were <clears throat> taught there were a lot of things that you know to do that not to draw attention to ourselves and not to transfer our culture uh, to their culture, but to be a learner of their culture. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of um, national friends who were the the inside informants to help us learn the culture. And we both have we're lifelong learners, so we just ate it up you know, all the time. In general, Chileans are very friendly towards Americans. But then, yeah. of course, we were in a community of believers, and they had 
actually pray for 10 years for a missionary to come to that area. So they, they were ready, and of course we were ready, but we didn't know Spanish until we went to language school. And so I, all that was, that was probably the biggest hurdle to overcome because we were in our 30s at that time. Yeah, yeah. We had a, uh, we drove a, a Toyota double cab pickup truck, Hilux pickup truck. And it was so high off the ground, the, uh, the Chileans called it the white horse. And it was so high off the ground that I couldn't wear a straight skirt and get up in it. <laughs> Before they got the truck for us, we had a little yellow Nissan, and I was out in the, the mountains and the, these rutted roads and all that, and I saw something in my rearview mirror, and it looked like a you know wet stream or something, and I realized that I had uh, hit the gas tank with these rocks that were in the middle. Oh, wow. And I had a friend with me, uh, a Chilean friend, and he saw this little kind of country store out in the middle of nowhere. And he said, stop, stop, stop. And I was, what are you doing? And he ran in and came back with a bar of soap. And I thought, the horse, the horse. Yeah. He crawled under the car and took the bar of soap and he rubbed it and created these shavings that uh, provided a, uh, a stopgap for the hole until we could get an hour and a half back to the city to get it repaired. And that's when the mission board said, I think you need a four-wheel drive double cab to get a pickup. <laughs> and, uh, so, and I think I got as many as 21 people in that pickup wow. one time because the people would walk to church and uh, most of them didn't have a car. And so, you know, you'd stop to pick up a family of four, a family of five, and there was always room for one more. And to give you a kind of a picture, um, he was talking about the volcanoes, snow-capped volcanoes and lakes. Uh, southern Chile is called, and that area in particular is called the Switzerland of South America. Oh, mm. yeah. interesting. Very interesting. Mm. A lot of uh, German pastry-type foods mm. influence uh, are there. And, uh, yeah, Sunday when we got uh, the tuxedo cake at the Mother's Day lunch, there were raspberries on there, and we have a strong association with raspberries in Chile. There was a German bakery, hmm. and we saw these big boxes full of fresh raspberries. We said, this tastes like Chile. <laughs> <laughs> and the cookouts were, uh, they called asado, <coughs> and they would be on a long spit, you know, over open flame fire, and um, cooking it slowly for hours. So it was usually lamb, um, and I think we had a horse one time because <laughs> when I asked our host what type of meat was this, uh, he said, uh, don't ask. So no, <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite good, whatever it was. Yeah, good food. <laughs> because we, we worked with the Chilean nationals, but we also worked with uh, Chileans who uh, were an indigenous group called the uh, Mapuches. And so they were the Mapuche Indians of uh, southern Chile that were another factoid, never conquered by the Spaniards in the 1500s. Wow. The only <laughs> indigenous group that was never uh, taken captive by the Spaniards. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. I love the story, Francis. I'll, I'll never look at a bar of soap again <laughs> without thinking of you know, the ingenious things that you can do. Always carry a bar of soap and a roll of toilet paper. Uh, <laughs> and, a, and a plastic bag. Wow. If you plan on going overseas, we have some little inside. <laughs> um, give us some insight into something about you that we don't know, that you would like us to know. <laughs> well, um, growing up, I was a very shy child and later mid middle school I think I was voted as the shyest person in my class when they were voting on these superlatives you know, <laughs> the most successful and popular good looking and uh, so that tells you something and so I credit uh, scouting and becoming a, a boy scout and then of course I went all the way to Eagle Scout and got in country and order of the arrow and so that was that's very meaningful experience mm -hmm for me as a young uh, boy and then, you know, a teenager. And that really shaped my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, had a lot of good role models 
in my life, um, other men and women as well. And um, so, um, I was a uh, an Airbnb host. At least my name was on the you know on the listing. Francis and I did it. It was definitely a team effort though. And um, for about three years before moving here, we stopped because we moved here. And uh, we asked Amy Rosen early on in the process, could we still have do Airbnb? And she said, I don't know. We probably need to talk about that. <laughs> 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 and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Met some of the most interesting people from all over. We mm -hmm. thought we initially thought they'd be coming to the uh, twice a year to the uh, furniture market and staying at our mm -hmm. house for that. People came for all kinds of reasons we didn't anticipate from everywhere, and it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Weddings or to see the grandchildren or... Lots of things that... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Something else uh, that I tell people is that I'm semi-retired because I thought I retired in 2019, but then I went out and got three part-time jobs, <laughs> and <laughs> a friend of mine said, Francis, what part of the word retirement do you not understand? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so now I've scaled back. I only have two part-time jobs. Um, and so um, one of them would be at Davie Medical Center in Bermuda Run, where I'm an associate hospital chaplain. So I'm on call uh, sometimes. And so if you see me blasting off out the door, you're like, Looks like you're going somewhere, you know. <laughs> and then my other part-time job is with Hayworth Miller Care Home in Winston-Salem. And I do a lot of different things there, um, just part-time as needed. And one of the things that we discovered, one of the trends, and here's another fact for you, Jim. Uh, <laughs> another trend in the United States is that there are more and more people that do not have a pastor. They don't know a pastor personally or they don't know of a church home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so they're yeah. not connected to a church. Yeah. But say when their loved one passes away, they want to honor that loved one and, and have a memorial service that would be fitting to their faith. And so I'm on the short list of pastors, former pastors to call to conduct a memorial mm -hmm. service. And that's been really interesting and a surprise, and I've met a lot of... Uh, interesting people and families and been able to continue to minister to families but in a kind of a part-time so there again if you see me blast off and out the door <laughs> with a suit on because I don't normally wear a suit and tie <laughs> that's where I'm going but when I was in college at Elon uh, University where we met um, I, a friend told me about a part-time job he had that he had to leave and he said, are you interested? And I said, well, where is it? He said, what's well, a funeral home in Burlington? And I said, oh, really? Tell me more. And uh, they had an apartment upstairs. So my junior, senior years in, at Elam, I lived at the funeral home and worked, and I was on call all night at times. And so for me, it's kind of full circle mm -hmm. you know, going back wow. that I never imagined doing in my wow. retirement. Yeah. Wow. How interesting. When I check, when I fill out forms and it says the, what's your work or you retired, I always start to check retirement and then I have to stop myself and say, no, Bonnie, you're not retired. You're doing the same thing you've done for over 25 years and that is tutoring slash teaching Spanish. And it used to be all in person and now it's all online and that's worked out well. I really enjoy it more than any job I've ever had. I love to see the light bulb turn on. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, you probably know by now because this is the sixth or eighth session of this that we've done, but one of our stock questions is um, if all the details were taken care of and you had the chance to have a meeting or a meal or a drink or whatever with um, three people in all of time, either together or separately. Mm -hmm. Who would they be and why? Yeah, I think all these three guys would have to be separate. <laughs> you'll, see, <laughs> you'll see why. <laughs> First would be uh, Martin Luther, because there were so many changes uh, in world history 
in the 1500s, you know, the printing press, and there are a lot of uh, coming out of the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, so to speak. Um, but Martin Luther was uh, a seminal figure in the Reformation, you know, when actually God broke into church history and uh, got us back to the scriptures. And so I think sitting down with him to talk about that because he never meant for there to be a Reformation as we know it. And uh, his friends and how those friendships worked out when there were some disagreements and how did you work that out and you know, did you ever think there would be this happening and I'd love to interview him. The second person would be uh, Coach Mike Krzyzewski. He was the head oh. basketball coach at Duke University for 41 years. So that, I don't think that, he that. and Martin Luther would have much in common. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, he's won five national championships. And uh, I keep waiting for that phone call that he might recruit me, <laughs> that I could be a walk-on for the team uh, since I practice basketball here. And uh, But, you know, I, I don't think he's going to call me, Jim. Uh, so, and then the third one would be a, um, he became a prominent figure later in the, the war of uh, the Battle of 1812, to where we almost became British again. And uh, sometimes that's called the Second Revolutionary War, because we were outmanned, outgunned again, and uh, Baltimore was under attack and Fort McHenry was under attack on September uh, 13th and 14th. And uh, this guy walks on board this British ship to for this prisoner exchange. And they decide not to let him leave because uh, he has seen their strategic positions and all that. So they keep him and his other friend. Uh, and so he writes this poem called The Defense of Fort McHenry that you and I know as... The Star Spangled Banner, exactly. And so he finished writing that on the morning of September 14th, which is my birthday. And his name was Francis Scott Key. Wow. So, yeah. I think if I could get those three guys together, I don't know how the conversation would go, but those are my three. I'm sticking by it. Well, uh, with, uh, with the coach at Duke, I have no idea. I've, I haven't had the pleasure of um, playing basketball or even getting close to him, but uh, the, the former chaplain at Duke as a Catholic priest was a good friend of mine. Okay. And he had absolutely wonderful things to say about um, Coach Mike and what a, a good guy he was in addition to being, of course, a superb coach. Um, and the, uh, <clears throat> the Irish Catholic in me would sort of wonder how he and Martin Luther would probably get along. Because uh, depending on what version of Catholicism <laughs> right. he was from, we used to give um, Luther a pretty tough time exactly. when I was growing up. However, uh, thanks to Helen, my, my wife Helen, um, I got involved with the Lutheran Church and learned a lot about Luther okay. and thought, hmm, maybe, maybe we were a bit rough on Luther growing up. <laughs> I think like most stories, there's always two sides. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. And sometimes four. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yours? Yeah. I would like to meet my maternal grandparents. Uh, they died when my mother was young. Uh, her, uh, when she was nine, her father died. And when she was, I think, 14, her mother died. So I never got to meet them. And I've heard a little bit about them, but not enough. Uh, I do think my grandfather, the way he was described, I want to ask him if he prayed for future generations because I really believe he did. I think he prayed for me, and he didn't know me. Of course, mm -hmm. he didn't pray for me by name. <laughs> but uh, I'd love to sit down and talk with him and see family similarities and genetics and all that, too, uh, and meet them. And the other person I'd like to uh, meet is uh, Winston Churchill. I'm not a history buff by any stretch of the imagination. But um, my interest in him was piqued by the movie that, I can't even remember the movie now, but it's just an excellent movie that came out a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, he, he was a man who, who kind of, from what, what I know, he was a man who swam against the tide and he had 
he was a visionary and he could see things that other people couldn't see and they thought he was crazy for quite a while. Mm -hmm. they, and they stopped inviting him to dinner parties because he would always say something they didn't want to hear. And that's why I'd like to sit down and talk with him. Of course, he'd have to catch up on everything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you could fill him in, though. I could fill him in, and then I could pick his brain. <laughs> All right. All right. Is there a river landing surprise that you, when you came here that you didn't think? Something that you didn't know, and whether it pleased you or not. <laughs> I had heard about all the, the fitness classes and things like that, but experiencing all the fitness classes, um, all the opportunities, um, and then later the, the new wellness center, but just to be able to play pickleball, basketball, water volleyball, bocce, uh, corn toss, um, and on and on and on, I think the biggest surprise is um, we have become more active and I think um, probably in better physical condition because of um, all those opportunities. And maybe the other surprise is we probably knew that we couldn't do everything here, but when, once you get here, you really find out you can't do yeah. everything uh, because there's so many wonderful opportunities mm -hmm. being offered. And um, I'm just surprised that, wow, that we could be in a place this nice, uh, friendly people and be able to play different sports that, you know, I, I just didn't think I'd be doing yeah. at this age. So, Francis, it just dawns on me that back to your aspiration to play basketball at Duke, right. given that you're involved with these other things, maybe you could check in to see if if Duke has a corn toss team, <laughs> and yes. you could get there and then just wander down the hall and. See Coach Mike. That that might that, be. That's a great easy. idea. I, our church had a men's retreat recently, and uh -huh. the corn toss was one of them. And uh, I was showing the young guys how to, how to toss it, mm -hmm. and uh, it was going in the hole. And they were they were like, "Whoa, who is this guy? I mean, where did he come from?" So I think you're on to something. There. He's got some maybe, good maybe, tips. Maybe the NCAA could. I'm not sure if corn toss. Is an NCAA sport. There's <laughs> actually a, a national championship for corn toss. That's where I learned there my is. technique. Pardon, pardon we we saw it on TV. Yeah. We saw it, yeah. Yeah. Well, Francis, maybe you need to get an agent. I think I already have one. <laughs> <laughs> With At least connections. Two. Bonnie, what's your surprise about? There have been lots of nice surprises here, and I'll quote our our dear friend Hilda Berry. She said, I knew it was going to be good before I moved into River Landing. She said, but it's even better than I expected. Mm -hmm. And I can say ditto to that comment in lots of different ways. Too long a list to make. But the one thing that I realized that's been the biggest ongoing surprise is how convenient um, and user-friendly our two-bedroom apartment is here in the building. I'm... Um, and I real and that's made me realize, comparing it to our house that we lived in for over 25 years in Clemens, how inconvenient some things that we, you know, experienced there and just tolerated. But we loved living there. We <laughs> didn't see them as inconveniences until I moved into these extremely well-designed two-bedroom apartments. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep I keep finding things that are conveniences and user-friendly things about it because of the way it's designed. Mm -hmm. That's been the biggest How surprise that I didn't see coming. Great. Yeah. Um, well, speaking about seeing coming, as you were coming to this session, um, were there things that you had anticipated talking about that haven't come up or questions that you anticipated that haven't that haven't come up? Can't think of any other questions. I thought you might have a good Irish beer for us or yeah. <laughs> some kind of beverage. With us. <laughs> well, I should remind people that we're taping these um, and it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so and it's 5 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Alan, Alan Jackson. That's a great Alan Jackson song. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, one of the additional things that, that I realized about 
uh, and people don't know about me, that probably doesn't matter, which is kind of stepping in back into another question, though, because I don't know, I don't have an answer to the question you just asked. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was a kid and when I was a teenager and thinking about what will I do when I grow up, I thought, well, I've got a lot of different interests, so I don't want to be a specialist in anything. I just want to, you know, do, take a broad stroke, so don't back me into a corner. That's a personality thing. But uh, one thing I know I will never be is a teacher. And that's the thing I've enjoyed the most. Look at you now. That's the biggest <laughs> surprise to me personally. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought about one experience. Uh, having our grandsons visit before COVID and taking them fishing. And that's kind of a highlight of uh, taking two young boys fishing. And I had uh, caught this pretty good sized carp in the pond and was trying to get it to shore. And my oldest grandson had the net and was bending down to scoop it up. And the line broke about that time. And um, I think I was the most disappointed of the three of us. And my oldest grandson just said, well, we can come back tomorrow and catch the same fish, can't we? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I, I hope so, but it really doesn't work that way. <laughs> and, uh, but that's been an, another experience, yeah. surprise, a part of River Landing is when your family comes to visit, uh, which we haven't seen ours in 16 months now, but when they do come to visit, um, you love for them to interact with our family here at River Land, mm -hmm. you know, to have our grandsons uh, send them on a scavenger hunt. And they just had a ball, and they had to interact with residents. And, um, so they think we live in a, a wonderful... Yeah, the older of the two was very disappointed when he found we were going to move out of the house in Clemens because that's the only memory he has of where we've lived. But uh, he has definitely warmed up to River Landing. Both of them have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that River Landing has warmed up to them, too. Oh. I have fond memories of meeting them when they were here. And hopefully they'll be back before we're all too much older. And, and, uh, and they haven't even seen the Wellness Center yet. Yeah. It's been no. built since they've yeah. been here. Is there something that we have not asked you that you would like to share as far as your education, your background, your life before River Landing? Um, I majored in psychology and sociology. Okay. okay. And um, I wanted to, to study something that I could apply in a lot of places, and I have. Mm -hmm. and so it's worked out. And did you? I'm oh, sorry. Did you start teaching Spanish after you came back from Chile? Yes. Or did, I, I, yes. did you know any before you went? No, okay. I did not. I mean, except hola and all that. Mm -hmm. you know, just <laughs> some greetings. And uh, when a friend of mine, I was looking looking to get a part time job when we came back, and a friend of mine said, "Well, Bonnie, you should tutor Spanish to high school students." And I just laughed at her. I just thought that was an absurd idea. And uh, she said, no, I'm serious. There's a need for that. And so I checked it out, and I'm, I'm very thankful that she suggested that That's about right. 25 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Bonnie also has some training in the Myers-Briggs personality inventory, so that's an interesting thing. And then the Enneagram uh, has been something she's looked a lot into about personality and, and how we complement one another. Um, so... My degree was in business administration, Elon. So there again, I was going to be that businessman and all that. And um, I worked at Wachovia. My nickname at Wachovia among the car dealership uh, salespeople was Repo Smith. <laughs> that is another story for another episode. <laughs> well, I, I believe we are... Um, continuing these conversations starting in the fall, so maybe um, you'll you'll get the story such that it could be aired. We can headline um, you as Repo Smith. 
I have a lot of stories. <laughs> and, and we had the romantic experience during our engagement year of uh, when he would go looking for repos, uh, past views, past views. I rode shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> wow. This, this was before cell phones, so mm -hmm. I would say, you slide over behind the wheel, leave the motor running. <laughs> if I am <coughs> running in the car, <coughs> get ready. <laughs> Sounds like we have, could have a whole series, <laughs> like, not just a conversation. However, this time, um, we've had a lovely conversation, thanks to both of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And um, next week, we will have another River Landing um, conversation. And we'll be joined by um, Lodi Smith. Uh, Rody Gibbs. Gibbs, excuse me. Here's Pardon me, Rody. Oh, I almost made it through without a goof. <laughs> and uh, Rody, as uh, lots of you know, is currently the chair of the resident council and um, will have a whole interesting set of perspectives from that vantage point. Thank you for joining us and good afternoon.